Hello, everybody. When that video was playing, I was looking at my seatmate to see if he was crying. <laughs> but that video set the tone for my speech. The date was August 2, 2011. I was on the road amidst a downpour. And you know how it is in Metro Manila when it rains, people and vehicles just multiply out of nowhere. So uh, since I didn't want to get stuck in EDSA, which at the time was visibly on a standstill, I decided to take a familiar route, Mother Ignacia Avenue. Now, although aghast by the seemingly, you know, um, that they were not able to address the usual flooding in the area, I still decided to take a risk. I, um, I, it wasn't completely unfounded, and certainly I wasn't under the influence of any sort of drugs or alcohol. I had had occasions where I successfully trod that path despite its age-old defects. But, but as you can see right there, I failed miserably. Luckily for me, I had the Filipino trait by any hand to count on before water levels could submerge my car and worst, drown me along with it, locals rushed to the rescue and carried me and my car onto dry land. When I alighted, media rushed to interview me, fully sympathetic to the ordeal they just witnessed, or so I thought. I thought the whole point of the interview was to highlight an important issue, and that is defective conditions for roads, public works, so on and so forth. After all, I was just a citizen accessing a public facility, right? I mean, it should have been okay. That's something we can normally expect from government. Use a public facility, come out of it alive with all your limbs intact. In fact, it's such a basic thing that the law imposes a strict liability upon local government units for deaths or injuries arising out of defective conditions of our roads, public works, etc. Yet, here I was, meeting an accident. Res ipsa locitur. The thing speaks for itself. Under the normal course of things, I should not have met an accident. That was news, at least for me. Media disagreed. News was, here you have an obnoxious guy whining endlessly about everything. But, I was no Lindsay Lohan or Kim Kardashian. I was just an obscure private individual. Well, visibly upset on so many levels, but understandably so. In making a news about a distressed man at his worst moment, for no other reason than to subject him to public ridicule and condemnation, media reared its ugly head, pitted against its immense powers. I stood no chance. Before I knew it, I was the Casey Anthony of the Philippines. Everybody hated me, cursed me, mocked me, called me names the most notable of which is the title, Pambansang Bobo ng Pilipinas. First fan page created for me, hitting over 20,000 fans in just a couple of hours, and it was growing exponentially by the minute. Almost 50 related fan pages were put up for me. Most of them hate pages, of course. And it just really got out of hand that people started creating spoofs of the video footage. They created Christopher Lau images and even Christopher Lau collectibles. Can you believe? I mean, my video YouTube's earned a combined total of a whopping over half a million views. <laughs> well, you see, um, this was the worst, and the final nail in the coffin, somebody said that they take in insult to Christopher Lau para magpakamatay. Scared, right? <laughs> because I had yet a career low in my life. I was devastated. I suffered from severe depression, mental, mental instability. I isolated myself. It was inevitable. I bled heavily. Most of the people don't know that. Until today, I don't know how that phenomenon can happen. But I was just bleeding, 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 bleeding for a week. Until now, I'm still under medication. Um, well, the effects of bullying just manifested. And the manifestations underscore extent and the severity of the bullying that I had to endure. Injury mounted by a throng of trolls inflicting mental and emotional harm with little or no accountability through anonymous accounts. I even experienced the worst effect of bullying, and this one I'm not ashamed to admit. That is, I almost committed suicide. By now, it should be clear that bullying is not a harmless rite of passage, but has serious consequences the deadliest of which is suicide. 
a series of um, bullying-related suicides in the United States and across the globe has drawn attention to this close connection between bullying and suicide. Okay? Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that suicide is the third leading cause of death among young people, resulting in about 4,400 deaths per year. According to studies by Yale University, your bully victim is twice to nine times more likely to commit suicide than non-victims. And according to a study in UK, half of these um, violence among young people are related to bullying. Finally, according to statistics, statistics reported by ABC News, nearly 30% of students in America are either bullies or victims, and that 160,000 kids stay home from school each single day due to fear of bullying. This year, New Year, 2013, I hope doesn't suffer the same fate as 2011 and 2012. 2011 and 2012 saw lives lost to this social disease. 14-year-old Jamie Rodemeyer was bullied throughout middle school for being a bisexual. Jamie was no stranger to hate messages, some of which read, and I quote, we wouldn't care if you died, no one would, so just go ahead and do it. It would make everybody way happier. Now, kudos to this kid, because despite these difficulties, he managed to put up helpful videos on YouTube. Unfortunately, he was found dead by his sister in the morning of September the 18th, 2011, a month after I was bullied in an apparent suicide by hanging. Now, before his death, he posted a tweet on YouTube, oh, sorry, a tweet on Twitter, <laughs> saying, and I, and I quote, Bye, Mother Monster. This was directed to his idol, Lady Gaga. Bye, Mother Monster. Thank you for all you've done. Pause up forever. Now, his death sparked outrage worldwide. But can you believe that even after his death, he was still being bullied? According to his parents in an interview on the Today Show, during a homecoming dance attended by his sister, bullies were chanting that they were glad Jamie was dead. Talk about lack of awareness. A month later, another, another teenager and Jamie Rodemeyer's namesake, Canadian Jamie Hubley, was reported to have committed suicide for the same reason, bullying. 15-year-old Jamie Hubley was, was bullied heavily for being gay. He uh, had been under multiple antidepressants and uh, professional supervision. He had been very vocal about death being a viable alternative for him. His last post on his blog entitled, You Can't Break When You're Already Broken, is a rather heart-wrenching portrait of a young boy looking for, but ultimately unable to find acceptance. He said, and I quote, I'm a casualty of love. Remember me as a unicorn? Maybe in my next life, I'll be a flying squirrel. I'll fly away. Before his death, he always wanted to put up an anti-bullying organization at his school, which fortunately is being, which effort is being continued by his parents who recently put up the Rainbow Club, aimed at promoting acceptance of other people. Just to show you that bullying chooses no age, that teenagers and adults alike can be casualties, 20-year-old Dutch Tim Riverink took his own life for the same reason. He was being bullied, and just like the other two Jamies, for being gay. Now, the Irish Times reported that he was heavily mocked online and that bullies would put up fake messages under his name some of which read, and I quote, I'm a loser and a homo. Now, his parents agreed to publish their son's suicide note in a local newspaper because, according to them, and I quote, this should never happen again. So what was in that note? In that note, Tim said, and I'm going to translate this, Dear Mom and Dad, all my life I have been ridiculed, bullied, abused, and excluded. You guys are amazing. I hope you're not angry. Till we meet again, Tim. You know, the scary thing about it is school authorities and even his parents were completely unaware or oblivious as to the extent of the suffering until his suicide. But that's what bullying does. It's a silent killer. So right now, I'd like you guys to imagine yourselves in the shoes of the parents and siblings of these fallen victims. How would you feel if your child or brother or sister is suffering deeply due to bullying, yet you are completely unaware of it? And when you do find out, it's already too late. I could have easily joined them in 2011. Yet here I am, and it still amazes me. How did I survive? Well, I ran away. I isolated myself, but luckily, in that opportunity, I was able to reflect 
on my life philosophies and paradigms, which no longer held tenable in the face of my unprecedented crisis. So definitely, I had to change them in order for me to live. What with, I had no idea until I was in Chiang Mai, a province in Thailand that values simplicity and detachment from the world. There, I had an epiphany. That is, happiness is a choice. I realized that it was mine and mine to lose, and that it could not be dictated by other people, lest I set myself up for inevitable defeat. Um, you say it's a cliche, yeah, but uh, I think that it's at a crisis or at a tipping point that we come to comprehend the full import of any cliche or any wise sayings, for that matter. Because of that, when I subscribed to that model of happiness, I became freer, happier, more creative, and expectations just became a thing of the past. True enough, um, my new model of happiness with weathered the test of this vicious and unforgiving world when I had to bury my dad in the same season as my ordeal. So, um, as they soldered my dad's casket in place, I peered over and threw my final rose and bade him my final farewell. And in that instant, I knew that we had been prisoners all along, prisoners by this world, made to chase after worthless things. We are like the prisoners in shackles in Plato's allegory of the cave, like fleas buried deep in the rabbit's fur, unable to see things for what they really are. At the sight of death, all our concerns just seem so petty and ridiculous and embarrassing, in fact. So my epiphany allowed me not only to live, it allows me to go the extra mile. So right now, I am educating an entire nation about bullying and its effects on mental health and self-esteem. In the process, I also promote better values. I constantly remind our fellow men to derive self-worth by own merits and not by diminishing another's. I also lobby for legal safeguards to be in place. Last year, I lobbied for the passage of the anti-bullying bill, which requires school authorities to observe a no-bullying policy under pain of uh, either suspension or revocation of their respective licenses. So with that, I'd like to end by um, thanking a couple of institutions. I'd like to thank the Department of Education for coming up with the child protection policy, which has a zero tolerance to bullying policy. Thank you for supplanting the holes in our system. I would also would like to thank the Jesuit uh, Basic Education Commission for launching the Not In Our School anti-bullying campaign. So you guys have no idea how much this means to me and other victims out there. And then finally, I'd like to thank Ateneo TEDx for this wonderful opportunity. You have given me so much um, honor by inviting me here, so thank you. So thank you guys, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.